Hi there. I'm Brendan O'Connor. My presentation is entitled Sacrificial Computing for Land and Sky, which since you only have one track, hopefully you all know. So a little tiny bit about me, and some of this is going to underlie the way I approach this particular problem. So I um, have my own security consultancy, Malice Afterthought. We do security consulting, security teaching, lots of kind of stuff that, you know, makes bad people cry. But the other thing is that I have this I-N-A-L-Y. I am not a lawyer yet. I am a first year law student at the University of Wisconsin, which is kind of a different thing for me. Um, I realize there's, you know, lots of boo his lawyer things, but don't hate them all. Some of them work for the EFF. They're good people. And the, the thing is that um, being a graduate student has certain advantages, right? When you're a graduate student in computer science, you can have the department pay for all of your research. When you're a graduate student in law and you want to do research in computer security, they tend to say no with this kind of bizarre look on their face and then they back away from you slowly. So this is kind of a problem because I'm like, well, I, I know I'm doing this law school thing, but it's not really that hard. It doesn't take that much time. Don't listen to anybody who says it does. You should all go to law school in your spare time. So I want to be able to do security research. So I've got a couple of rules that are going to come out. Cheap and cots. Cheap is the first and foremost thing, right? I'm back to being a graduate student. I want to be able to build a device that I, a whole network of devices that I can use as a research platform. I used to do sensor networking research. I've done some other types of network security things. Um, and I want to be able to do them on a grad student's budget, right? When I was at Johns Hopkins, I worked with a lab who spent four or five, sometimes more hundreds of dollars per node and then was deploying many nodes and doing sensor networking research, right? Which was great, right? They had lots of cool capabilities. Four or $500 a node doesn't work on a grad student budget when you're not being funded by a university. So I needed something much, much cheaper, especially because then we ended up spending a lot of time trying to find nodes whose batteries had just died so they couldn't say, I'm over here anymore, right? When you do a multi-month deployment in the forest, sometimes you just lose these things. So we spent a lot of time just wandering around the forest looking for nodes because we didn't want to pay to replace them. Right? This seems kind of silly, right? I feel like full tenure faculty members and all of their grad students shouldn't have to wander around a forest. So I wanted a research platform I could deploy a bunch of while still staying within a budget. Um, and to be clear, this entire talk deals with just a hardware system. So I'm approaching this problem, we're going to talk about it here, as just a network, a sensor network thing. I think a lot of you guys can come up with new and exciting things to do with this hardware, and that's great. But we're going to pretend this is just a sensor network ex uh, talk. So I want it to be cheap, we've already talked about, but I also want it to be COTS. So for those of you who haven't spent way too much time doing government contracting, COTS means commercial off the shelf. And that's a, a pretty simple thing, but it has some cool implications for this type of research. One thing is we have repeatability, right? If I can go to Amazon.com, buy the hardware I'm talking about, assemble it in, in my office, and you know, deploy it in, then I have a certain degree of repeatability. If I wanted to go and say, I need 10 of these things tomorrow, I can do 10 of them tomorrow. If I have to scour Craigslist or eBay or the back rooms of my local hackerspace in Madison for the, every part I need, a lot less repeatability, a lot more time involved in just hunting down parts. The other thing that COTS equipment gives you that a lot of other things won't is the ability to evade supply line tracing. So if you're deploying these sensors, let's say they're, they're adversaries who don't want you to sense things. For instance, there are research projects with sensor nodes in the Chesapeake Bay, and lots of people don't want you to say, oh my god, there's tons of pollution in the Chesapeake. Or lots of people, you know, some of whom have guns, might object to throwing sensors over their fences for reasons we won't talk about. And so we want a way that when you throw a sensor over their fence and they find it a week later, you don't want them to be able to find anything about you. Okay? So all of the hardware, therefore, we want something that is deployed everywhere. Right? If I have to custom fabricate a circuit board, there's only a few places that do that. And you know, a determined enemy can go and say, well, who fabricated the circuit board? Ask the three or four manufacturers, they're gonna get a name. That name is going to be of someone, whether it's me or not, who does not want to be confronted by bad men with guns, right? So we don't want to use any kind of bespoke engineering. It needs to be stuff you buy on, e on eBay or Amazon that you can buy in any country on the planet. None of this dual use technology, ITAR restricted stuff. So the basic problems that we have is, as mentioned, bad men with guns, right? There are always people who don't want you to access things. And so there are solutions right now that we use to do sensing of areas with bad men with guns. One of, them, one of my favorites is called WASP, right? And a lot of you have probably seen the WASP presentations at this year's DEF CON, last year's DEF CON, several other places. So it's the Wireless Aerial Surveillance Project. And the idea is you can fly over the head of bad men with guns and you know, do sensing and then you can fly home. 
So there's a couple problems for me with this. One is that it's $8,000. Um, doesn't work on a grad student budget, right? That's a significant percentage of tuition for an entire year. The other is that it suffers from a very human, unique problem, which I call the vulture problem. We've been hardwired for 100,000 years of lizard brains. If we see something circling overhead, we think it's a vulture, and we don't like it, right? Because that means there are dead bodies. Or in the case of if you have a gun, you riddle it with bullets. Now, admittedly, this did start out life as a target drone, so it's kind of designed to be riddled with bullets. But even so, it's hard on the $8,000, right? And again, you can't just throw it away. So we need something that costs a lot less than this. The other thing is that this $8,000 buys you 40 minutes of time on site, or less depending on travel time. Not a good value for money, not on a grad student. We also have this existing solution, right? For those of you who don't know, this was the, one of the um, FBI illegal, now thankfully, uh, GPS tracking devices that was pulled off a car and dissected in this nice photo, excuse me, nice photo by iFixit. And look at the thing on the top there. That's a roll of D batteries duct taped together, for which the government apparently paid something like $4,000. So much money that even the government had to go demand it back from Wired. How embarrassing is that if your equi equipment costs so much money that even if you've been displayed across national tabloids, you have to go say, oh, I'm sorry, we actually need that back because we can't afford to replace it, right? Again, even when you have government funding, cheap is still useful. And the other temporary access solution is the black thrower, Svartkast solution. You take an old computer, you fill it with a bunch of bad stuff, you drop it off. The problem is, that's the kind of computer we usually use. And I don't know if you've noticed, but that's not what computers look like anymore. Um, I haven't for a few years. Um, that is what they look like in the back of your hacker space, right? Or the ones you can buy off Craigslist. But they don't really fit into a modern office environment or a forest or really anywhere else. Um, so we've sacrificed subtlety in order to get cheap. And I feel like we shouldn't have to sacrifice subtlety, right? We should be able to get everything we want. We should be have, able to have the all singing, all dancing thing for less than 100 bucks, or even less than 75 bucks. Also, you can't drop them. And I like dropping things from high heights. That was one of my design goals. So what I want is disposable computing, right? Remember when these things came out, not always with the McDonald's and Coca-Cola logos, right? We had disposable cameras. You could use it once and then throw it away. How cool is that, right? For, I mean, it, setting aside the whole thing of, you know, the American greed problem and how we just throw away perfectly good things, you have something that if you lose it, right, if your camera fails, it's okay, right? You don't have to go hunt down people. You don't have to chase the mugger through the subway. You just say, ah, okay, pull another one out of the box and move on, right? We don't do that with computing, which leads us to these extreme compromises, like having to send the FBI back to go grab a GPS after it's been posted on Wired's danger room, right? That seems like a compromise we shouldn't have to make. So the functionality requirements I had for this as a cheap grad student as for my sensor network, I wanted to have multiple wireless radios. I wanted to have some sort of USB, which excludes a lot of cheap things off the bat, right? Unfortunately, most routers don't have USB unless you get into a little bit higher end than I wanted. The reason I want USB is for reconfigurability, right? With USB, I can plug in anything from a bunch more wireless to GPS antennas to anything I want, and it just makes it life a lot easier, right? And you can buy USB stuff on eBay or on Amazon exactly the same way you can't buy another USRP module on Amazon, right? Turns out it doesn't work. We're gonna have relatively long battery life, right? It doesn't need to be measured like an academic sensor network would in months or years of battery life, right? But hours to days, right? We want something more than 30 minutes time on target. We want it to be relatively tiny for concealment and we want it to have storage, but you notice a little star there. So the storage is kind of a problem. If you have storage, then you can do lots more analysis right on site without having to get all your data back immediately. But if you have storage, it gives bad men with guns something to say, aha, this says I'm emailing it back to Brendan, right? Or, you know, hopefully we're a little smarter than that, but you get the idea. It gives them something to do forensics on, right? A lot of people in here, I'm sure, are very good at doing forensic analysis of recovered disks. It tends to be kind of a problem, right? And as soon as you do full disk encryption, you have a key management problem. So it's an issue. It's not an issue that I'm solving right now at this moment, but it is something to think about. Do you really need this? Because not all the missions I've talked about need it. And indeed, the machines I'm bringing here don't actually always use it. And the other thing is we can't use Arduino. So this is a problem. Those of you who come from the maker and hackerspace community will know that Arduino is the answer for everything, right? <laughs> it's like, when in doubt, plug it into the internet because it should totally work. The problem is Arduino doesn't meet this challenge and I really wish it did. But let's look at the numbers. So it's 30 bucks for the board, right? Which isn't bad. It's $90 for a wireless radio. 
So it's $180 for two, okay? Then it's another $15 for an SD card, it's another $100 to add a GPS. We're running out of pins, we're way past running out of money, right? We're back to the five or $600 a node. So even though it horrified all of my friends at Sector 67, the makerspace in uh, Madison, it's just not gonna solve it this time. Sorry guys. So this is the solution I came up with, which I called F-bomb, because one time I worked for DARPA and they love terrible acronyms. So it's the falling or ballistically launched object that makes Brendan happy, right? It's not that makes backdoors, because this isn't just a security talk, right? I promise. Um, and the, so the obvious choice to make all of this thing and what a lot of you are gonna look like, hey, doesn't that look like Shiva? You're right, it is, it's a Shiva plug, but it's not the normal Shiva plug, right? Those of you who don't know, Marvell a few years ago released this awesome system on a chip called Shiva, which has an ARM5 or ARM6 chip and a few other things on it. The problem is it's $100 for a dev kit plus a bunch of other things. And it turns out when you take apart that dev kit, it has a bunch of power rails and other things that don't like being cut open and re-soldered together, right? So we need something a little bit cheaper and a little bit more friendly. And so I turned, like many hackers before me, to something that's bright pink. Because why would you not turn to something bright pink? And here it is, for those of you who are a little bit closer or it's on the screen, it's the pogo plug. And the, some of you will be saying, but wait, Brendan, the pogo plug costs $150. Those of you who don't know, the Pogo plug is a NAS box. It's a design you can plug in your stuff and have it shared across the internet. Very auto magic, right? All of us in this room have no doubt used OpenBSD and other you know, hardcore methods of sharing everything and streaming across the internet. But for mere mortals, we use a bright pink box, right? The problem is that they don't sell very well. And so Pogo is in this horrible situation. They need to get rid of a lot of back inventory. And they've been needing to get rid of back inventory on the order of a year, and it doesn't show any signs of letting up right now. So these things are on constant fire sale and have been for the whole, the CFP time, the waiting time, this whole talk. You can go right now on Amazon and buy these for $25 a piece. You get a whole Shiva plug, you get an ARM5 or ARM6 chip around the 5 to 800 megahertz range, depending on version. You get 128 megabytes of RAM. You get a lot of bang for a very pink buck. Um, you, the thing is that we're gonna wanna get rid of this case, right? Because unless we're infiltrating the Hello Kitty store, it ain't gonna fly. <laughs> So this is what F-bomb nodes actually run most of the day, right? We have the, this is the Pogo Tech B01 mainboard. There's a couple different versions of the Pogo plug. The differences don't really matter, although I'll tell a slight story about the differences in a minute. Um, basically, they've all got about the same functionality. Then we've got a flash drive, which is that cute little metal thing sticking off to the left. And understand the scale of this whole thing. This whole thing is four inches wide and three and a half inches tall and about three quarter of an inch high. And that's only because of the ethernet port. So if you rip that off, you're talking less than half an inch high. Okay, so this is a tiny little thing. We also have two RTL8188, that's the Realtek 8188 chip, um, which I chose for tiny little size. Especially because, that, because it's optimized for small size, the fact that the antenna is smaller than your little toenail doesn't actually seem to affect it, kind of weirdly. You're not gonna get as good of results as you would if you had a big, huge external antenna, right? Like one of those alpha jobs with the big panel. But it works surprisingly well in a variety of situations and is smaller than the USB port itself. So the total cost for all of these different things, the flash drives and RTL8188s are all eight bucks a piece, as in prices you can buy right now with free student Amazon Prime shipping. Um, so you can build this whole thing for less than $49, excluding power, right? So this is kind of a cool base. And the whole thing, the other thing is that this runs Linux, right? If you learn Arduino, you have to learn a special language or set of special languages. You have to learn how to interface to every board. No, this thing, you run Linux, the 8188's driver has been in the kernel since I think 2.6.37, so going on a while now. Um, and there's tutorials online for how to install it, right? It's basically plug and play, which is kind of awesome. So let's talk about power, right? Power is the other problem when you deploy these kinds of systems because they, you don't get to bring power with you. Sometimes you do get to use AC power, right? And that's obviously how it's designed to ship, right? Plug it into the wall. Um, we only need about 3.4 watts at full load that is transmitting on both antennas constantly. Um, so it's not a huge amount, but it's not nothing either. So AC is great when you have it. So everybody says, ah, well, let's turn to lithium ion batteries, right? Because those are the new sexy thing, right? If it's 7,600 of them are good enough to put in a Corvette style roadster, then one or two should be great. And that's awesome, except that they're, again, really expensive, right? We're paying between $2 and $10 per watt hour. 
And remember, we need about three and a half watt hours per hour of operation, okay? So even though they're nice, it tends not to work. Same with ultimate, ultimate lithium batteries, same with nickel metal hydrides. I'm looking around going, well, surely there, how did we get battery power before we had these nice cool batteries? And then Costco came to me and said, in a dream, and said, Brendan, remember how you can buy hundreds of dirt cheap batteries at me for almost no money at all? And I said, Costco, what was this strange thing? He said, it's an alkaline battery, Brendan. <laughs> how many of you know how much power is in a D battery? Just one D battery. How much? Well, several, yeah, several amps worth for high current load, right? But the total amount of power stored in it is actually 18 watt hours. That's a huge amount, right? If you want 18 watt hours in a little thing designed to charge your iPhone, it's going to be a block this big, right? And it's going to cost you 70 or $80. This is ridiculous. You can buy a, you know, $10 for a dozen batteries at Costco. D batteries have 18 watt hours per battery. So four of these things is almost more power than you're ever going to need. It's kind of amazing. We're paying about 4.4 cents per watt hour on an alkaline D battery. And for those of you who are concerned about protecting American jobs from overseas investment, we actually make these things in the United States, unlike all lithium batteries. Weirdly, we make them in Madison, Wisconsin, which I didn't know until I'd almost finished this presentation, even though that's where I live. So yeah, a guy on the ham radio said, you know, I actually work at that plant. What? Like in China? No, here. It's amazing, right? All these supply chains we've forgotten about, which a scrounging grad student finds for you again, right? It's an amazing thing. So why not solar? Solar is a problem, right? I wish we could use solar because then it could run forever. The problem is that the numbers just don't work out, okay? To get a, a five watt solar panel, which is about the bare minimum because you don't get 100% efficiency, but let's say you did, so five watts, right? That's about an eight inch by eight inch square, about yay big, okay? You're gonna pay 50 bucks for it at best and it weighs half a pound. So we've lost weight, we've lost money, we've lost everything. And then you have to add rechargeable batteries, right? You can't recharge alkaline batteries. That's why they're so ungreen, right? And remember, we're throwing the whole thing away when we're done with it, right? Because we don't want to have to go say, I'm very sorry we illegally GPSed your vehicle, but can we have it back because our boss won't pay for a new one? So we can't drop this kind of money, right? We don't want to drop this kind of weight. And the thing is, we're about to throw this off of a plane in about two slides, so we <laughs> don't exactly get positioning, right? It's five watts if you position it exactly right into the cameras, or into the lights, excuse me. But you don't get um, that when you just drop it on a roof and hope for the best, right? You don't get that if you live in Madison at all, ever. Um, certainly you don't get it this winter, right? We just dropped another foot of snow on my roof. It turns out my solar panels get nothing. So that's not that helpful, right? So then we have power stability as one additional problem. I'm sorry, my phone is going off in the middle of my presentation. How rude are you? So we need power stability. We can do power stability for a buck or six bucks, kind of depending. So I mentioned that there are different versions of these things. So when you cut these open, you'll either find a five volt power rail inside or a 12 volt power rail inside. And I'd tell you the model numbers that are do different ones, but it turns out they make no difference because I just ordered a bunch of these things off Amazon and they all came with a box that said one thing and a sticker on the bottom that said another and a sticker inside the case that said a third. Again, if you're fire sailed your entire supply chain, labeling problems, okay? So just open it up, run a multimeter on it. Surely you've got a friend who has a multimeter. You only need it one time for about 10 seconds, right? So you either get power stability for a dollar if you can use a 7805 chip, which I now have a bunch of that I can't use because they're all 12 volts, or you get it for about six bucks off eBay, right? They were probably made somewhere on the third shift of a factory that only has two shifts, right? Some of you are familiar with this problem, but it's okay for our purposes because this thing will run at anything, but this is the 12 volt version and it'll run at anything between eight and 16 volts, even though it doesn't say that on the box. So we don't need perfect power stability. We barely need good power stability, but we need it if we're gonna run off only a couple. Um, if you wanna run a 12 volt device off of three or four AA batteries, you need a little bit of power stability. So that's why we get that. So then I do a series of very boring testing experiments, right? During which I read um, property and torts and things, bo which are very boring law things. So it was, it was a bad week, right? But nonetheless, it turns out that with 8D batteries, remember those 18 watt hours? With no regulation at all, just plugging them straight into the back of this thing, 
we can get 32 hours on target. So that means if I heave this thing over your fence, right? Or better yet, I pay some stooge to drop it in your place for you. Or, for those of you familiar with this trick, I FedEx it to some guy who's on vacation, okay? Um, it sits on his, box for two, on his desk for two weeks and the box sends me back all the data for 32 hours, which is plenty of time to achieve all of your wildest dreams of, no doubt, saving the endangered ferrets in the Chesapeake Bay area, right? <laughs> Um, with no regulation at all. With regulation, it gets even better, and we can use less batteries, right? On a 12 volt supply, you know, you can get away with three or four batteries. Um, the only problem we, I ran into here is something I didn't really expect, because when you look at a battery, it says, I have such and such amount of watt hours. And I say, thank you, battery. And then you look at the fine print, and it says, unless you want a lot of it at once, in which case I only have about a third of that. AA batteries are notorious for this. Each one has about three watt hours in it, but if you draw from them at high low, they only get a view about half a watt hour. So four AA batteries will only run this for about 45 minutes, which is still better than Wasp, and they cost about 30 cents total from Costco, but it's not great. So this is where you actually want to break out the whole $2 bill and spring for a four pack of Ultimate Lithiums from Energizer because they're designed for higher throughput of current. Okay? And again, you need the higher current, even though it's only three watts, because you have to step up to 12 volts. So there's a slight design problem there. So now, I mean, we've only got 50 bucks, right? But we want to look good, right? We wanted this thing dressed up like a billion dollar Department of Defense contract. So we need to put it in some cases. So let's get some good cases. This is the flight case. So I have it here, but the thing. This can actually clip to the bottom of a Parrot drone. Those cute little $300 quad rotor things that you can fly with your iPhone. A little bit outside, what you do is you get your parents to buy it for you for Christmas. It works pretty well, right? Now you've got the Wasp, okay? This thing can actually take power off of the drone's feet itself using this handy dandy Anderson power pole in the back. And you can then fly it onto somebody's roof and land if you'd like. Sit there for seven hours and then fly it back. It takes an amount of power that's essentially nothing compared to the drain the motors have. It's about seven hours if you just run the whole battery into it. So you're usually getting four or five hours of time on target. And you don't have the vulture problem anymore because you're no longer circling overhead. It, drones don't really like to circle anyway. Quadrotor drones don't. They like to kind of sit down on things and not run because running is when you lose all the battery juice. So for 350 bucks, the drone, the parrot case, everything, it seems like it's a pretty good improvement over $8,000 with five times the time on target. The other thing I'd like to point out at this point is 3D printing for the win. So this whole box was just printed off on a MakerBot. If you haven't made friends with your local hacker space, do it. They know things. It's crazy. They know, for instance, that if I, you go to them and say, I have this case and I would like to drop it off of my balcony. They say okay, first of all, which is kind of cool, and then they tell you things about internal reinforcement and other nice structural things that you probably didn't know if you're like me and not a real engineer. And then they will explain to you things like, okay, if you drop it like this, it'll totally work. And so indeed, this survived a fall off of my um, back balcony, which is four stories off the ground with no ill effects while running, okay, with the batteries in it, okay. Weighs about a pound. As you can see, it's not very big, not much bigger than a stack of three by five cards. Pretty small, pretty easy to hide almost anywhere you want. You can even drop it from the paradrone. It can still take off without much weight on it. If you want to um, drop it while you're in there, it's not that hard. All you need is a release mechanism. The simple and easy release mechanism would be an electromagnet. Turns out you can't do that because it takes too much power. So I used a hanger. Not proud of it, um, but it worked really well, right? It's not pretty, it's not James Bond, but it works really well on a grad student's budget. The other thing you can do is you can package it inside a carbon monoxide detector. Now I have a question for you. How many of you have checked that your carbon monoxide detectors don't have one of my little boxes in them? <laughs> because I'll bet none of you have, right? How was the last time you even hit the test button? The test buttons on this actually don't work anymore, but since no one ever tests their carbon monoxide detector, they barely remember to test their smoke detectors, it doesn't really matter. And because this is already a wall wart, right? This is already designed to plug in. It'll just sit there and run powers for years, right? It can use AC power straight off the tap. No one ever has to know it's a problem. When you close it, it looks like a perfectly normal CO detector. The fact that I've gutted it doesn't matter. Or you can throw it in ugly food containers. And if you're sensing the, no doubt, ferrets inside an office environment, this is the way to go, right? Slight problem here, a little bit of an implementation deal, don't put it in the refrigerator, which does lead to food like that, right? But nonetheless, don't put it in the refrigerator. It's a large Faraday cage. 
What works really well if you're infiltrating a law school filled, no doubt, with endangered ferrets is a box of stale Triscuits on the top shelf. Um, because no one will ever touch it, right? Why would anyone do this? Again, we're trying to be subtle, right? So stale, crappy food no one wants, right? They're like the last three goldfish, right? Or rice cake boxes, all very good, right? You need something with a picture on the outside that makes nobody question what's inside. Because if nobody really wants what's inside, no one's gonna find that what's inside is not rice cakes. <laughs> so this is a pretty good deal for you, right? I mean, you've got 46 bucks, you've got a whole, um, thing, it runs Linux, and anybody can assemble it who works at McDonald's for a day, right, on less than a day's wages. It's not tough. If you don't understand Linux, you can do it for 56 bucks. You can learn Linux <laughs> and do this, right? That's kind of awesome, right? You know, and it, you can build a device with the capabilities the FBI would attempt to arrest people just to get back so they don't have to buy it again. Now, here's the deal. I have a kind of hand wave through this whole presentation about the software aspect, right? So where is the software, right? I mean, there's some basic software, right? You install Linux on it, you can do pretty much whatever you want. But if you're gonna start dropping 10 or 20 of these things out of parrot drones and horrifying your neighbors and scaring your cats and all that, you probably want a better and more robust system, okay? And so I've got some basic software running on these things, the things you kind of expect, right? No doubt, you know, Ferret Counter 3.0. But if you want to do more and better and faster, there's really one place you go. And you know what? You had a great guy up here about an hour ago telling you exactly where to go. DARPA Cyber Fast Track. <laughs> so the software present part of this has just been funded under the Cyber Fast Track. It's not a grant. It's a research proposal that has been made under contract. It's called Reticle Leaderless Command and Control from me and Malice Afterthought. Okay? So we've got three months, we're going to make this into a nice botnet. You can have any stooge FedEx something who doesn't need to know a single thing about key management or anything other than hit blue button and run away, right? I may have to rethink that instruction thing a little bit. It might not work on Amazon, but nonetheless, it's going to be very simple, very nice deployment, and hopefully in about six months, we'll meet each other somewhere else and I can tell you all about the software aspect of this. So thank you, Mudge. My acknowledgements are as usual. My usual partners in crime, Dr. Griffin, who's been a friend and boss for a long time, and the eponymous Shade, and especially Chris Meyer and everyone at Sector 67. Again, I really can't recommend enough. Go to hackerspaces.org, find your local hackerspace, get in touch with them. If they've got 3D printers or just a bunch of guys in a saw and I'm missing a couple of fingers, they're still gonna be good contacts for you. And you can teach them about security, which they'll never have heard of. It's crazy, right? So, any questions? Nothing, really? That boring? I can't hear the yo. They don't freeze before you use them because the current draw will warm them. The fact that they freeze and blow up after the device is already dead doesn't really bother me because the see above, they're disposable. They don't blow up in the like hand grenade sense, they just leak, so it's not been a big problem. So, I mean, admittedly, I haven't tested this in Antarctica. So it's only gotten down to about 20 below in Madison this winter. It's been fine in that. So, anything else? Yeah. As you certainly could do that. Um, the, right, have I considered any anti-tampering? Thank you for reminding me of that. Have I considered any anti-tampering device to flash the memory, for instance? Um, that's something that really folds into the software aspect, obviously. Um, but the simple thing is, if you can solve the key management problem, you can use full disk encryption, right? So the question is, how do you solve the key management problem? Which is pretty much challenge one on the reticle project. So, anything else? Okay, thanks all very much. <laughs>